Hello and welcome. My name is Kushal Shah and I'm here with my friend and co-host Ayush Pranav. You are listening to Nails and Hammers, a podcast where we talk to different people about their journeys and understand how they take decisions and solve different problems. Our guest for today is Akarsh Khurana, who runs a theatre production company called AK Various and has worked on films like Krish and Karwan. If you enjoy this podcast, please make sure to like, share and subscribe to Nails and Hammers on your favourite podcasting platform. Hi Akarsh, welcome to the Nails and Hammers podcast. Hi, hi Kushal, hi Ayush. Thank you for having me here. Uh, so I wanted to start from the very beginning. Can you share a bit with us about where did you grow up and where, where all did you study? Uh, so I'm uh, uh, pretty much a Bombay boy. Uh, I was uh, born in Delhi because uh, my grandparents uh, were there. Uh, so that was it. But I've always lived in Bombay. Uh, I uh, went to school to Aryavidya Mandir in uh, Bandra. And then I went to college in St. Xavier's uh, in, in, in Bombay itself. Uh, after that, I did a couple of post-graduation diplomas. I did one in uh, film and television from Xavier's itself. And I did a, a, a post-graduation course in advertising and marketing uh, from this affiliated uh, institute called Wigan and Lee in uh, Bombay itself. Uh, it was a UK institute that had kind of set up something here for a brief bit. So I did an advertising and marketing course from there. And yeah. So were you competing with your dad in terms of education? Uh, well, actually, very interestingly, my father once told me that it is a son's duty to uh, educate himself more than his father. And uh, that was just after he had finished his PhD. So I told him that that's not going to happen. So <laughs> I'm not... Uh, you know, I'm not going to uh, be able to manage that. But uh, he was always a—he uh, was always very clear that even if you wanted to kind of you know get into some sort of a creative field, and if you want to eventually get into you know films and theater and all of that, it is absolutely mandatory to you know be a postgraduate first. Uh, so that was a minimum requirement. Uh, you know, as a as a fallback, if uh, everything else fails, at least you've done that much. Uh, okay. So uh, he's he's very. Uh, uh, He's very into education and, uh, you know, he also eventually did his PhD, he also teaches now. So he's, he's quite an academic in that sense. Yeah. And so uh, how was the Corona household like growing up? Your dad's an actor, your dad's, uh, I mean, has so many degrees. So how was it like growing yeah. up? Uh, so the thing is, dad has always been, uh, you know, quite a multitasker. Uh, so the thing is, of course, while he was acting, he was also always doing other stuff. So it never felt like, you know, uh, like I was the son of an actor. Uh, you know, right. It, it right. just felt like I was the son of a very busy and very intelligent man. Uh, uh, and uh, my mother also uh, uh, was a teacher and uh, uh, was teaching for many years, for 30, 35 years. So uh, it was it was great uh, uh, because, you know, they were uh, both very driven and uh, uh, they were both uh, still managed to, you know, managing to kind of make time for me and eventually uh, my younger brother. He's eight years younger than I am. Uh, after he was born and then I kind of went into college eventually. Uh, I think what happened is that the equation with my father became far more friendly and one-on-one. -on -one. It, uh, right. kind of, uh, it, it graduated into a very like relationship between peers. My mother always was, of course, very approachable. And, uh, uh, you know, and I think it was great to have really uh, woke parents. Uh, that's great. That's great. But I mean, did it add an impact when per se, I mean, your dad was into theater, screenwriting and, and movies was a regular part of your discussion tables over oh, dinner or something? I, I not, not when I was in school, definitely. I mean, that was uh, something that was not, uh, you know, work never came home in those days. Once I became involved in theater and all myself, of course, uh, then there was a lot of, you know, conversations about that because I mean, I was involved in my own pursuits. Uh, right. In fact, I do remember that as a school kid, uh, when I used to ever kind of drop up at like, you know, drop in at one of my father's shoots, uh, I used to find them frightfully boring. Uh, I would be like, you know, they take like an hour to do like, you know, two lines and I would be like, what is this? Why are people wasting so much time? In here? You know, so right. I, I remember being very disillusioned with film shoots. And even today, I mean, honestly, like, I think that if it's not your film shoot, uh, uh, I don't know why anyone would visit like, you know, like people, you know, people show up at film shoots and I'm like, this is perhaps from the outside, the most boring thing in the world. Uh, and, and from inside, of course, it's the most busy thing in the world because there's so much Absolutely. to kind of take care of. But, you know, when you're from the outside, it's such a slow process. Like for someone who's, you know, like a, uh, like a layman, uh, right. 
so yeah there was no uh, there was no uh, uh, that kind of imposition or too much i think what happened is that there was an awareness of the environment uh, right. which was a good thing like i grew up around theaters and uh, i was not uh, uh, inhibited on a film set because uh, they 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 were part of my growing up years so i think that was great uh, that there was an awareness of the environment uh, and therefore perhaps made me a little bit more comfortable and i think when uh, uh i was older uh, and i had started like you know getting dabbling in theater myself of course there were conversations about theater dad was writing a lot of films at that time and he would kind of you know use me as kind of like a sounding board where he would kind of discuss a few ideas and i think that's where the interest in writing came from actually in the early days mm-hmm. because you know i was i was seeing how uh, scripts were taking shape uh right. so i think that that was a so yeah it kind of i guess it all kind of you know uh, subliminally kind of gets into your system uh, right. but uh, having said that when i got out of my post graduation i actually joined a corporate job so i was yeah. i was in a corporate yeah. job for 3 years so uh, and then kind of found my way to like a creative space uh, so yeah so what made you leave your job and start your theater company uh so it kind of happened simultaneously i started my theater company back in 2000 i mean we complete 20 years this year uh okay. so i i started my uh, theater company uh, just as i was out of college i think yeah uh i had i, was, I graduated in 2000 uh, and i started my theater company in december that year and uh, uh so that was always going on but after my post graduation i uh, i got into a corporate job i mean it was a, it was a, it, i was a, i was a marketing manager in a movie company uh so the thing is i i kind of it was still connected to movies that i loved uh you know a feel that i loved and uh, uh my motivation to actually get into that company was that i got free posters and preview screenings so it was kind of uh, my decision was motivated by passion uh but i think once you kind of become like uh you know a part of the corporate machinery uh i think there was like a wake up call i think maybe 2 years into uh, my job where i kind of realized that the that you know the movies that i came in loving had kind of almost become commodities because i was on a phone talking about ye beta tape yahan pahunchana hai and like you know okay why is that delivery late and suddenly you're like okay it's taken out the whole romance i mean the entire romance has gone away like suddenly it's not about your passion and it's just another job and it was a very ideological standpoint and uh, uh, uh when i went and told my boss i mean she was very impressed that i could make an ideological standpoint like that but she also offered me more money and uh, uh, you know and i was like no i don't want that i want to leave for other reasons and then i got offered even more money and i'm thinking man they had this money and they weren't paying yeah. it to me but now it had become an ethical standpoint right because uh, right, right. now if i take it i'll lose the respect so uh, so yeah but so therefore uh, and and i was doing well i was i was marketing manager of the maharashtra and gujarat region and uh, uh, i was i was uh, Uh, I was doing pretty well. So, uh, but the thing is, and I was actually doing theater by the side. My company was running, so I would be in, uh, I would, uh, I would be in office uh, from say nine to six, and then I would go to rehearsal, and I would be rehearsing till one in the morning, and then I would kind of you know go back sleep for a bit, and then go back to work. So I think that the rehearsal process that was happening was always keeping me uh, creatively satisfied and keeping me going on with the job as well. but then at one point of time i kind of realized that you know this is maybe not what i want to do and this is not where i see myself uh, you know growing any further uh, so i mean having a, a production company is a different ball game altogether so right. how did you crack the industry and then did you have to do other things than just creating content see i have a production company only in the theater department i don't yeah. uh, i don't have like a, a a film production company that's a completely different thing right so theater production company in that sense is a much smaller scale kind of organization uh uh of course when you are starting off when you are 20 years old uh, it does feel like you know a huge undertaking uh and now we've kind of had it for 20 years and it's been a very interesting experience because i think what's happened in the last two decades like even the kind of you know the, the land, cultural landscape has changed Uh, and you know uh, theater has changed so immensely uh, you know theater used to be such an elite and intellectual kind of thing and now it's kind of opened up and like it's become much bigger and you have larger productions and people investing money in the theater and we've seen it through this entire phase when we started for the first 7 years we were just losing money i was basically uh, i was basically earning money writing films and i was spending all that money in my theater 
so it was kind of like a money pit uh, in that sense where and uh, at one point of time i think it was i think it was about 6 or 7 years in and we were just making losses as the company i mean uh, and i had no right. personal savings because all my savings were going into the theater company and uh, uh, and 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 dad came to me and dad told me that you know i mean it's really great that you're following your passion but you have to set a deadline and if in that deadline your company doesn't start kind of giving you returns uh, however hard it is you'll have to shut it down because otherwise it'll always land up being a liability uh, in your life and i was like shit i need to send a deadline because and it was 6 years in so i said okay let me try and do this for 10 years and if in 10 years i haven't been able to kind of you know stand on our own feet uh, then i'll take a hard call but very fortunately by the 8th year uh we actually got a couple of opportunities and a couple of big productions that did very well for us and we right. started rolling in the profits and from that uh, year uh, i mean minimal profits but at least uh, there were we were in the green and uh, fortunately touchwood i think in the long run if you look at the final analysis from that year which is i think 2008 from that time the company has supported itself uh, i have never had to put in put in uh, you know my personal funds uh into the company the company at the end of the day the balance sheet is such that it might not be making any profits but it's breaking even and it's supporting itself so that was very critical for me the other thing that i feel whether it's a production company which is for theater or for film or anything i think that i think that one mantra that people kind of tend to overlook and it's worked very well for me and i've seen other production companies that i've worked with that happen to be successful is because they value the people i mean the people are really the company uh you know so if you if you put people first if you kind of you know invest in that they are your most valuable resource and they are the ones that will give you the most uh, returns so that's always been something that's worked very well for me so right so basically uh, i mean post your post your corporate gig you quit your job you were working on a theater company and you were also doing screenwriting uh, gigs as well right so so basically what happened is when i when i quit my corporate job which i think was probably 2002 2003 uh uh was uh, around the time that i that i quit uh and i was looking for uh, you know something more creative to do besides just running a theater company um something that i could earn from and uh, there didn't seem to be any options because uh, you know i had just come out of a job and so uh my father used to write uh, uh, with a gentleman uh, robin bhat very senior writer in the industry and he had been my dad's partner for a while in the in the writing business uh he basically uh, offered me an opportunity to be his assistant uh okay. at that point of time basically it didn't mean any creative involvement but it meant sitting in the corner of rooms that there were discussions in and making notes uh and uh, it uh, 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 you know it, it it felt like a very small job like it felt very like you know you were sitting over there but it was a great learning phase for me because i got uh, to be in like you know rooms of five different projects that were being made so i mean uh, i was in rooms with ramesh sethi and you know raj kumar and vikram bhat and uh, you know shri ram raghavan and all these people uh, while discussions were happening and it was just observation and learning how different people work and i spent about i would say i spent about about 8 to 10 months being a writing assistant which is basically taking notes and i think right. that at the end of the year what happened was that i realized that this is not working out for me financially because i mean there was really nothing coming my way and uh, i wasn't earning enough and i might have had to consider going back to you know the a job and i actually opened conversation about going back to a job i i actually spoke to my former employers and said that you know uh, if there was an opening i'd like to come back and they were very welcoming and they said yes sure you can start you know from next month and uh, i was kind of kind of signing my creative death warrant uh, but i was uh, uh, going back to the company that i had left and i was actually saved by a very severe bout of hepatitis uh, i was hospitalized and i was in hospital for 11 days uh, and when i got out the doctor said that you cannot do any work uh, for at least 3 months you have to be you know home bound and you have to be on a very strict diet and uh, you know traveling for work is certainly not something that you can undertake at this point of time and that's what actually kind of uh, uh, turned the tide in a sense because i couldn't go back to the job i apologized to them and as i was recovering uh uh 
Mr. Bhatt, Robin Bhatt got in touch with me and said that, you know, uh, Rakesh Roshan is writing a film which is a sequel to Koi Mil Gaya. And he wants a young writer on board because it's a fairly new subject matter. It's the first superhero film. And is that something you'd be interested in? Because it's not hard work in terms of physical. You know, you'll have to come for a few meetings and then come for a few jam sessions and then come to sittings. So technically, you and I was, I jumped at it. I was like, yeah, man. I mean, Karan Arjun was one of my favorite films. I was like, yeah, okay. for sure. And uh, that's how that journey began. So in 2003, I got on board the writing team of Krish. And that was my first uh, official writing gig. I had done a little bit of writing in my uh, uh, ill time with my dad as well for a film that did eventually release called Sarhat Par uh, with Sanjay Dutt in it. Uh, but Krish was the big like full involvement kind of first project uh, that, I, that I got. And uh, I was in, involved in the writing process for a year. And the moment it got written, Mr. Roshan actually asked me if I would assist. And uh, wow. I then became assistant director on the book. So what happened is that Krish basically was my film school. Because I was there from the first word on the page till the final print delivery. So I saw every single process. It took three years of my life. But it, right. was, it, it, was, it was honestly film school. So. Right. And then Krish was one of the first VFX films in the industry. Yes. So, so how was it like to work as a VFX director? Uh, so, I mean, uh, the thing is I, that I, I was never a VFX director, but uh, what happened is that uh, I, I started off as a, as a fairly junior assistant uh, because it was my first time on a film set. Uh, mm-hmm. But I had also written the script, so I kind of had the advantage of being something like a script supervisor. Uh, so I was in, interacting with the actors and, and then what happened is I kind of started like, you know, taking on more and more responsibilities. So I was kind of moving up a little bit. And uh, mm-hmm. as the film was nearing completion, uh, one of the chief ADs who was actually, uh, whose forte, her forte was VFX. She actually got her own film to direct. Uh, and, and Mr. Roshan said that she should not let go of that opportunity. She should go and do that. So I kind of got bumped up quite by accident. Uh, uh, because uh, I was I was young and at that time perhaps a little with it, uh, so I kind of got shipped off to Chennai, which is where our VFX was happening, and I lived in Chennai for four months, uh, uh, supervising all the VFX. We had of course international VFX supervisors uh, who right. would come in from time to time from the US, but I was there on the ground basically overseeing all the VFX shots that were there in the film, and they were hell of a lot. Uh, right, so right. it was it was great it was great it was very eye opening uh, yeah. at that point of time so it was state of the art at that point of time now of course things have changed completely and I, you know I'm always playing catch up yeah I mean as far as I can remember that was uh, I mean an introduction uh, for the whole Bollywood industry to the whole VFX game right absolutely absolutely mm-hmm. and uh, uh, I mean this and, you was... know, the weird thing is that we had the capability we always had the capability because you know the studio I was in. Right. was also doing outsourced work for stuff like Chronicles of Narnia. Oh, wow. Yeah, the same people that were working on Krish were actually like working on battle sequences of Chronicles of Narnia, which had been outsourced to them. Oh, wow. So it's not like we didn't have the know-how. And also, uh-huh. I mean, like a lot of uh, a lot of South Indian films had actually been doing a lot of VFX from earlier. Uh, right. You know? uh, right. and, 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 and they were very evolved by then. It wasn't just the, you know, these days we talk about a lot of VFX, which is basically almost invisible to the eye. And, you know, like there's so much VFX in films that look like regular dramas, but, you know, there's so much that's been created. That kind of stuff was happening like back in 2005 in in Chennai when I was sitting over there. I mean, I remember uh, there was a Kamala Sun film that they were working on at that point of time. And they were actually creating uh, locations of New York uh, uh, on their computers. And it was being done like, you know... uh, like like it is done so casually right now. It was being done over there. So it was it was really eye opening for me. It was like wow. I mean like the world has like you know really moved on. And I was so right. glad that I got to be part of a film that was kind of breaking new ground. So you know. But was there like an added pressure uh, because it was something that was done in India for the first time? Not on me. Yeah. Uh, I mean I'm sure there was a lot of pressure on Mr. Roshan. Uh, uh, but uh, not on me. I mean, for me, I was like a, I was a kid in a candy store. So uh, uh, it was, it was fantastic for me. But I'm sure there was a lot of pressure on him, and um, I'm really glad that it paid off the way that it did. So yeah. So th- there's actually a, a 
Kamalasan and New York story where Kamalasan was like going around the Brooklyn Bridge and then NYPD arrested the entourage because they're like you know, taking multiple rounds of the Brooklyn Bridge and shooting oh, really? it. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I want to like talk about your writing a bit. So, yes. so what's your writing process like? Uh, do you lock yourself in a room uh, to write and how do you come up with like fictional ideas? Uh, see, I no, I'm not somebody who locks uh, himself in a room and works like that. The thing is, uh, I think one uh, uh, one thing that I've definitely inherited from my father is, you know, this uh, uh, multitasking situation, uh, which uh, uh, is almost a disease. But uh, <laughs> the thing is that uh, I I've constantly got multiple things going on. Uh, you know, and it's it's for various reasons. I mean, I've always run a theater company. Uh, there's always like you know uh, other stuff that I'm involved in in terms of like while I might be prepping for something, I'm writing something else or I'm pitching something else. Or I also run a writers' room, so we are constantly kind of working on new subjects to pitch. Uh, so there's my, my hands are generally quite full. So I don't. Uh, I've never had the luxury of being somebody a writer who can kind of lock himself into a room and uh, you know. And the thing is, actually, I'm one of those whose only motivation and inspiration is a deadline. Uh, that uh, when it's near, then I'm working really hard and really fast. But otherwise, I'm a big procrastinator in terms of you know uh, the actual writing of it. But what I do land up doing is. Um, uh, I actually spend a lot of time writing my first draft. So I am not one of the writers who kind of, you know, uh, enjoys doing multiple drafts. So for me, it is very critical that my first draft is competent. So actually, like the thing is, there's a lot of uh, uh, background kind of thinking and planning and note making that is happening before I write the very first word on, on the page. Uh, because, you know, I like that my first, very first draft is something that I am A, happy with. And of course, while there will be tweaking, it's something that is, uh, you know, presentable. And how, how do ideas for fiction come? I don't know if there's really an answer for that. You know, uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know if there's something that can be answered when say, so for me personally, I look upon uh, in, in my writing career, I look upon, uh, as a turning point in my writing career, I look upon this series called Tripping, uh, which I, I wrote for TVS. And uh, right. uh, that uh, was something that Sumit Vyas, who also acted in it, he uh, he brought to me, he asked me to come on board and co-write it with him. Um, that was, a, uh, besides the fact that we knew that it was going to be siblings going on a road trip, right? Uh, right. Uh, we really didn't know anything else. So uh, right. that was that was actually creating from the ground up, uh, right, right. and and uh, the great thing was that because uh, you know TVF was uh, a, a digital platform, uh, you know the uh, there was so much freedom to kind of write exactly what we wanted. You know, right. it was it, right. there was there was no fear in us attempting to you know use our own voice, and uh, for me uh, that way I think that. Tripling was a liberating experience because, I mean, I could take a lot more credit even for, you know, every idea that was in it rather than, you know, just making someone else's vision come to life. Uh, right. So, uh, so that, so, although, I mean, uh, having said that, a lot of what is in Tripling is actually from life. So, right. uh, I think that uh, a lot of your ideas actually come from what uh, you have experienced. Uh, a lot of your characters come from what you have experienced. And I think that, you know, when you're consuming content as much as you are, and there's so much consumption happening, uh, you know, your uh, your likes and dislikes and your, uh, you know, things that you connect with are all kind of, you know, at a very uh, unseen level forming. And that's the, that's the place where your influences are kind of formed and you don't even know it, you know, at that point of time. You don't even know that this is, these experiences are shaping you. Uh, uh, and I think that that's where this your creative universe starts building. You know, somewhere the story, somewhere the story that resonates with you the most will kind of, you know, spark off another thought of something which is in a similar realm, uh, you know, and then you kind of start coming out with permutations and combinations of a seed thought, uh, 
uh, and uh, yeah so i i don't think there's a i don't think that uh, there is a, any kind of formula i think ideas come from ideas so yeah right. do you have to motivate yourself intrinsically if if the project is not creatively challenging uh i think fortunately i have never been part of a project project that's not creatively challenging uh you know i don't think that uh, uh, there's always something uh, to kind of attain you know and uh, like even if you look at a, a project that say since we are talking about ham shakals for example uh writing comedy is very difficult uh and and it's you know and when you're you're selling like a madcap idea like the one that was over there it actually sometimes land up being more work you know uh it's very easy for people to write it off and say oh the writers were sleeping uh yeah. but uh, no something had to go and get shot right i mean we had to kind of write an entire film out and it was never an easy job and it's always it's always challenging see writing is not an easy job it is a very difficult job uh and i don't understand why people do it but uh, <laughs> uh the thing is that uh, uh you know it is a very challenging job and i think that's what's kind of you know finding a solution to a problem is really i think what keeps you motivated so you know. and then wrapping up the whole conversation around films and uh, movies so uh, one of your most famous acting uh, portrayals is in ye meri family as harshu's father yeah. so did you have to make a mental model switch to be an actor uh okay so the thing is i i i'm not a very happy actor i don't enjoy it at all uh and uh, uh that's why i don't do too much of it uh most of the acting that i've done is either because friends have insisted or because i've got to travel abroad uh so uh, my motivations are very clear in, in in that sense and it's not even the money like i mean i keep getting ad film offers and you know i i just i'm too lazy to do that uh samir saxena who directed uh, uh, ye meri family is a very good friend he also uh, produced tripling and both seasons of tripling and then even i landed up casting him in my film karwa uh, to you know take revenge uh, but uh, uh, so he was very keen that i do ye meri family and uh, i was very skeptical uh, quite honestly because i mean it's a you know it's a it's, it's set in jaipur again of course yeah. and uh, uh, you know i was a very urban kid always and i didn't have you know the nuances that were needed uh for something like that to be relatable uh so i was very skeptical but uh, samir was very confident that he could kind of make all of that work uh you know and uh, to his credit he did i mean quite honestly like uh, a lot of people eventually got in touch with me saying that they felt like i reminded them of their father from jaipur at that time in the you know uh, a lot of small towns Uh, also resonated with the portrayal of the character and uh, honestly i can take no credit for that because mm-hmm. i i i actually did no homework on that it was all i was basically following orders over there uh and doing exactly what the writer and director were telling me to do so so the thing is because i am not a regular actor uh you know uh i am very conscious because i have worked with actors uh that when i am acting my director switch has to be off it can't be on it's not no, no, no. me directing it is somebody else's vision that i have to help tell so i mean uh it's it's important for and i think it helps that i'm a director because you know in an ideal state you would like your actor to kind of work with you you know and uh, i think that that's the least respect you can give to a director that you've agreed to work with i'm absolutely surprised by by your comments on this because i totally fell in love with your character and i mean Like you mentioned, I, you right? know, as did as did everyone. I mean, it was very yeah. surprising. I used to I, I get happy Father's Day messages, and 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 uh, uh, you know, and and a lot of people uh, get very emotional about it. And and quite yeah. honestly, like I, and, I mean, I don't even know if I should be saying these things, but I can't ride a scooter. Okay, I can't do that. <laughs> I, you know, I couldn't right. bloody park the damn thing. Uh, right. Uh, and and they were patiently helping me through everything, like you right. know, like a right. simple thing about going and you know how you kind of uh, you know wet a terrace. Uh, you know with the mug and i was just not getting it right because i mean yeah. it's not something i do like you know it is not but uh, samir uh, and 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 sorov khanna the writer they very patiently kind of led me through everything and they right. in fact even fed me the little nuances that you know this is how a middle class father from uh, a, a second you know like a, a, a second tier kind of city right. would behave right. in this situation so 
the warmth and the personality uh, i can take some credit for uh, in right. terms of you know but but everything else that was being done whether it's uh, parking a scooter or tying a mattress uh, were all things that uh, you know i was perhaps not well versed when i was following orders yeah. so it was great that the director's vision uh, you know resonated with people in such a such a way and it's a lovely show it's a lovely show yeah i don't know it's, it's quite a special show so yeah Uh, we now want to shift focus to know more about Akash as a person. Uh, so, what do you do to unwind? Uh, I'm uh, I read a lot. Uh, that's something that uh, I've I've always done. And in fact, in the middle, I kind of uh, let go of it a little bit. Uh, I think uh, when uh, OTD platforms came in, I think the the most easy thing to do to unwind was to do some binge watching, uh, and, right. and and it felt like the most comfortable thing to do, right? But the thing is. Uh, I do. I, I uh, and I think this was uh, when I was shooting in Jaipur. Actually, when I was shooting in Jaipur, I kind of made it very conscious that, uh, like, when I come back from shoot, instead of you know winding up my day with uh, you know watching something on my iPad from Netflix or you know whatever, uh, I uh, I should kind of you know uh, read a bit. And uh, I'm a massive foodie, so uh, food is my go-to. Uh, uh downtime yeah so, so and, it I mean, shows, and it shows yeah so. <laughs> yeah so how do you recall i mean what do you read and then do you do you read with the intention of adapting it or something no, i don't i don't read with the intention of adapting ever uh you know very surprisingly and and this is something uh that i have noticed about myself i never watch a movie like a technician uh you know the thing is I have so many friends in the industry, and you know who will watch a movie with such a um, such a critical eye, you know, right. or, or a director's eye. You know, uh, I feel like you can't enjoy a film like that. Uh, I feel like the first viewing of a film should always be just a viewing as an audience. Uh, then, if I like it enough, or I hate it enough, and I want to watch it again, and I want to tear it apart, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and and do that, then that's a different ball game altogether. ha huh, if some like some you know koi ghanti baj jati hai and you suddenly like okay wow there's something in the story that you know i that stayed with me and then i want to kind of you know maybe say it at some point of time or you know then you kind of but that's that's uh, it's never the intention it's never the intention to pick up something i in fact i never read or watch anything with the intention of uh, adapting mm mm-hmm. uh i mean what happens when i mean there's something where you put a lot of effort into but it does not turn out the way you intend to i mean it fail completely um uh, i mean that's life right uh uh it's uh, there's always going to be um something that could have been done differently and uh, uh it really depends on you know like the thing is I, I, what i feel is that um and this is something that perhaps uh, took a little time for me to uh, understand uh, i do think that to survive in any kind of industry that uh, rides on uh, viewership or rides on any kind of you know audiences uh, that kind of industry is always going to be open to lots of feedback and criticism right it's always going to be open to more opinions than you know if you were a doctor and were doing a surgery i mean very few people except the people that you you know operated on will have an opinion about uh, you know how it went but when you're yeah. creating something that is for public consumption it's 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 very open to uh, uh judgment and analysis and uh, uh, i think that uh, and by yourself as well uh because you know you're reviewing your work again and again i think that what's very important to survive in an industry of that nature is a certain amount of detachment uh the thing is that uh, otherwise it gets very difficult otherwise everything can get very depressing you know i think it's very important to understand that this is a project and a lot went into it uh but it's not the end of the world you know at the end of the day it is it is one thing that you did and it perhaps failed but if you approach things with the right intention there will be more opportunities you know i think that uh, failure is 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 a very it's a part and parcel absolutely it's it, you can never keep everyone happy 
uh, you can never keep yourself happy. I mean, you might have the biggest blockbuster in the world, but it could have been personally something that you're not proud of. Uh, I think uh, you have to prioritize, and I think that it's very important to uh, be satisfied with what you did. And like, how do you stay at the top of your game, being a jack of all trades? Honestly, uh-huh. I don't know if I stay on top of my game at all. Uh, and I think that maybe that is because I am a jack of all trades, and hence, as the saying goes, I am the master of none. Uh, but uh, so I can't, I can't assume that I am at top of my game. Uh, I, I, I do know that there is this, uh, there is this hunger to do as much as I can. There is this hunger to be as productive as I possibly can. and uh, i've got my finger in many pies at a time um uh, i i i manage my time and my work well uh but i can't assume that i'm on the top of my game on all of them i try and do uh give my best to everything because eventually it's going to kind of you know represent me the good thing is i'm uh, i enjoy what i do i don't do it because of some sort of ambition i'm not a very ambitious person uh you know so the thing is that i'm 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 doing what i enjoy doing the moment it starts feeling like work uh i'll probably stop doing it. uh the 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 uh, so as long as it's, it's something that i'm enjoying doing uh my drive is there and i think that that results in a uh, competent work at the very least so uh, mm-hmm. uh, then you work with creative people quite a lot so and they are the most difficult to manage i mean i see So, what are some of your hacks to manage creative people? Well, I mean, see, the thing is, uh, I don't think uh, you know one very important realization that happens, and I think that everyone who's kind of been in that situation is that you know when you're a director, for example, uh, a director's job is fifty percent people management. Uh, honestly, that's that's really it. I mean, the thing is, when you're particularly when you're directing, like say, a film or something, and you know the you're basically working with so many experts right everyone is an expert in their own department so in right. that sense like the technical know how is all there uh, so you know what is your job you're putting it together you have an overall vision that these people are all kind of you know coming to contribute to your main job is people management your main job is communication you have to make sure that your uh, what you want to achieve is being communicated to these experts they are there because there are experts and uh, you have to kind of you know trust them and not impose upon them uh you have to give them the freedom to try and interpret your vision and lastly uh, what advice would you give to a 20 year old akarsh oh wow uh, <laughs> i was 20 what was i doing when i was 20 i was just i just out of college and I started my theater company uh i'd say go with your gut because that's really something that has worked out for 40 year old akarsh uh to a level that 40 year old lakers is happy with and i think that's what's uh, that's what's important so uh, don't be afraid to just trust your instincts is what i would say just go with your gut do what feels right yeah. lovely lovely on that note uh, let's let's move to the rapid fire question we have a oh, bunch wow, of wow yeah. okay yeah so okay. basically i mean the first thing that comes to your mind you can just throw it away right wow. so uh, you mentioned you read a lot what's the last book or uh, what are what are you currently reading I am currently reading a Japanese uh, author's book called Before the Coffee Gets Cold. Okay. Uh, okay. I've just started it. I just finished a Stephen King novel and I've just started uh, this yeah. Interesting. Uh and what what are you what are you binging on right now? What's the latest show you're watching? Uh I have just finished uh three series uh, three seasons of a show called The Leftovers. uh on uh hbo uh hbo production uh, based on a novel again uh, by tom perota uh so i'm watching the leftovers and uh, my brother has written the dialogues for a show called avrod uh okay. which is about the uri attacks so right, uh, right. we're watching that this uh, is on sony live this is on sony live yes, yes. yeah 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 okay uh if you have to choose between and pick one between uh, ye meri family or car one What? wow uh man those are two totally different job roles uh very difficult uh, choice uh, but karma so all right got it and your pick between writing directing and acting directing 
direct okay mm-hmm. okay and mainstream uh, films versus web series doesn't matter or, or, or theaters for example or th- yeah or theater it doesn't matter i think uh, 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 any platform that allows you to tell your stories is great it doesn't matter i have no preferences i'm happy to tell a story wherever i get it and i want to actually say them in all places so i don't want to let right. go of any right. very greedy that way so yeah. <laughs> right well right. one one last question uh, rithik roshan or irfan khan irfan khan uh i think they both came into my lives at very different stages of my life um and i think that the stage of my life that irfan sir came into uh was a very relevant stage of my life and uh, uh hence uh, and not only because of his absence but i think that the uh, the impact of the personality was much stronger uh you know when i was interacting with uh, uh with hrithik roshan uh, you know for the seven years that i was in uh, film craft his father's company uh, okay. i was i was very young and kind of finding my bearings and you know i was i was overawed by everything and i was still trying to find my feet uh in that right. sense so i don't think that the, the that uh, uh like an, a very strong equation could get built in that because you know that it was a it was a it was a phase of struggling in that sense for me uh i could have a far more one on one relationship uh with advancer and uh, it's in light of recent events of course that was very precious so yeah um so i think that's the end of our conversation oh lovely and, and thank you so much for your time and i i hope you enjoyed it as much as we did yeah it was fun man it was quite nice and like free flowing and yeah it was good <laughs>